1 Corinthians chapter 8. Wayne, can you uh, please pass out outlines? These are brand new outlines, so everyone gets one. 1 Corinthians 8. And let's have some riddles here tonight. See uh, how you folks do. See if that, uh, that cold snap has frozen your brain or not. <coughs> A little bit. We'll have the gals against the guys again, and you stand up. If all, if you, all you do is this, except for you. You can do that because you're already standing. But uh, uh, everybody else, you have to stand, okay? Got to get up. And, uh, if you, and if you, you know what? I'm going to do this. If somebody, because somebody did this last week, and maybe twice, uh, if, if you shout out the answer, I'm going to give it to the other team. Okay, so don't do that. Don't do that. All right, here's the first one. First one, when is the top of a mountain similar to a savings account? Jack, you ought to get this one. Yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> How about this? How about that? How about this one? Uh, who had it next? Yes, sir. What? No. No. That's not right. Yes, ma'am. I doubt if a kid will get it, but. <laughs> You're on the right track, but you've got the wrong words. <laughs> when it piques one's interest. The top of a mountain is similar to a savings account when it piques one's interest. Okay, nobody got that one. A man goes out for a walk during a storm with nothing to protect him from the rain. He doesn't have a hat, a hood, or an umbrella, but by the end of the walk, there isn't a single wet hair on his head. Why doesn't the man have wet hair? Mrs. Beam. Mrs. Beam. He's bald. That is correct. All right. And you know that because. <laughs> All right, one. One, one, one. Actually, one of these has actually got a spiritual thrust to it. No, oh, amazing. Um, but it wasn't that one. <laughs> uh, I love to dance and twist. I shake, not, not me personally, okay? I, this is the question. I love to dance and twist. <laughs> twist. Boy, that would date me if I said that. I shake my tail as I sail away when I fly wingless into the sky. What am I? Mrs. Beam again. A kite, correct. Woo! Woman's on fire. Whoa, she's got it. And you used to work in a bank too, Elizabeth. You should have gotten that first one. Uh, when you stop to look, you can always see me. But if you try to touch me, you can never feel me. Although you walk towards me, I remain the same distance from you. What am I? Titus. Who's up, Titus? Yes. No. No, not correct. Yes, ma'am. Can't hear you. No. Nope. Yes, ma'am. No? No. Answer is the horizon. When you stop to look, you can always see me, the horizon. But if you try to touch me, you can never feel me. You can't reach the horizon. Although you walk towards me, I remain the same distance from you. When am I? The horizon. Next one, you see a boat. It's filled with people. It has not sunk, but when you look back, you don't see a single person on the boat. Why? They're all married. They're all married. Got it. About time. Guys got on the, on the board. <laughs> and, of course, that would be a single guy that answered that question. So, <laughs> All right. Let's see. What's the next one? Um, what is it that no one wants to have 
But no one wants to lose either. You don't want to have it, but you don't want to lose it. What is it? Yes, ma'am. Still didn't hear it. Still didn't hear it. I'm getting my I'm getting my hearing aids on on uh, Friday, just so you know. Your what? Youth. Your youth. No. No. What is it? No one wants to have. Of course, everybody wants to have youth. <laughs> what is it? No one wants to have, but no one wants to lose either. A lawsuit. No, a lawsuit. A lawsuit. You don't, want, you don't want to have a lawsuit against you, but you don't want to lose one if you're putting one against somebody else. A, I welcome the day with a show of light. I stealthily came here in the night. I bathed the earthly stuff at dawn. By noon, alas, I'm gone. What am I? The dew, the morning dew. It's correct. <laughs> two to two. Tied up. What goes through cities and fields but never moves? Yes, ma'am? Air? Nope. Air moves. What goes through cities and fields but never moves? Yes? What? A w <laughs> that would be correct, but that's not what's down on the paper. But you. What else is like that? Yes, sir, Jude? Road. Yes, roads. <laughs> correct. And don't tell me railroad tracks are railroad roads, okay? <laughs> well, but they are. That's why they're called that. Uh, what, can't, what can be touched? I'm only going to take what's on the sheet, okay? What can be touched but can't be seen? And the key is the word touched. We use that terminology. What can be touched but can't be seen? Yes. Your heart, absolutely, got it. Tied back up again. All right, let's see what we got. I'm only going to say this once. In a bus, there is a 26-year-old pregnant lady, a 30-year-old policeman, a 52-year-old random woman, and the driver who is 65 years old, who was the youngest? Say it again. No, no, it's not correct. Mr. Beam, the unborn baby, correct. Correct. Like I said, that's a, that one's got a little bit of a, of a uh, spiritual... Uh, Twist it. And I was surprised it was in it was in a bunch of, you know, not necessarily religious riddles. But that is correct. That's very correct. Uh, when it is alive, we sing. And again, I'll only take what's on the sheet. When it is alive, we sing. When it is dead, we clap our hands. What is it? No. No. When it is alive, we sing. When it is dead, we clap our hands. What is it? This one's kind of tough. Yep. No. <laughs> when the orchestra is all dead, we clap our hands. <laughs> What'd you say? No, no, a birthday candle. We sing until it, until it dies, and then we clap our hands. When it is live, we sing. When it is dead, we clap our hands. Birthday candle. 
When, what can go through glass without breaking it? Light, correct. Correct, correct. Four to four. Man, this is tight. Woo! Ah. What gets bigger the more you take away? Yes. A hole, correct. Girls just forged ahead. Five to four. Come on, guys. At least tie it up. I only got one more left, but I can, I can grab a tiebreaker here. I have no life, but I can die. What am I? And I'll only take what's on here. Yes. Three. No. My car. <laughs> Close. A battery is correct. The girls win it. All right. Six to four. Woo! These girls are on fire tonight. All right. <laughs> uh, those are fun. I enjoy those. I enjoy watching you guys jumping up and down. Man, that's probably the best part. All right. First, first Corinthians 8. Let's all, <clears throat> let's all stand together. We're gonna read, I'm going to read the whole chapter because it's only 13 verses. And it'll get us in context of, of what's going on in the chapter. It says in verse 1, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be, many, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some, with conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol." Uh, and uh, their conscience, being weak, is defiled, but meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see, see thee which hast knowledge, set it meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience ye sin against Christ wherefore if meat make my brother to offend I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you so much for each one that's here. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, caring for us this week, for every ounce of grace and every ounce of mercy and every ounce of love and protection that you poured out upon us already this week. Lord, the truth of the matter is every single day uh, we've gotten many, many blessings, more than we even recall many times. And uh, Lord, we're looking for a blessing tonight from your book. Help us, God, to get a hold of some principles that will help us to live a life that's pleasing and honoring to you. We love you. We're certainly glad that you're our God, that you're our Father, uh, that uh, you're our Savior. And Father, I pray that you would uh, have your will and way in our hearts tonight. Guide us and direct us 
as we study your word. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, amen. You may be seated. What, what was the, the controversy that was going on at this time? Well, the, the, the question that they had was, well, you know, the meat is offered to idols. Uh, can we eat of that meat? And, uh, the, the, you know, there, I'm sure there were different situations that took place. One of them was, was that after the meat was offered to idols, they would take it into the marketplace, which they call a shambles, and they would, they would sell it, and they would sell it at a discount. So you're getting oftentimes premium meat at a cheaper price. But the populace understood that it was offered to idols. And some folks, some folks stumbled over that thing. Um, the other situation that they had from time to time is they would go into somebody's house, and that person had bought some meat that had been offered to idols or possibly was even given it. And, uh, and then the question is, well, should I, should I eat it or should I abstain? And, and uh, you know, what, what, is the, what is the main issue? One of the reasons why I wanted, you, wanted to read the entire chapter was so that you get the, the broad overview of the chapter. What's the main issue of 1 Corinthians chapter 8? And is the main issue, should I or should I not eat that meat? That's not the issue. The, 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 the main issue is, what are, the, what are the principles that ought to guide us in these areas where we don't have always a clear-cut scriptural admonition or command for or against it? How do you, you know, what are, some, what are some principles that you use? And the truth of the matter is, there's things like that in life every day. And, uh, and you have to have some, some wisdom to know what to do or what not to do. And what principles ought to, ought to guide us in those areas. And I don't know what, what you would call it, if you would call it uh, unnamed areas in Scripture, or if you call it gray areas, but especially when other Christians are involved. You know, one of, the, one of the things that we were careful of as a family is that we realized that uh, not everybody has the same standards. And, and uh, because you're at diff- everybody's at different levels of the, of the Christian life. When you've got a church like this, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing because you can watch, uh, you can watch other folks grow and you watch folks you know understand some things that they didn't understand before and therefore make some life decisions that's a blessing but you need to be careful because what we do in our liberty might be misunderstood particularly by a weaker brother or sister in Christ and you don't want to be a stumbling block. You don't want to be an excuse for them to do something that would violate their own conscience. So that's, that's really what the thrust of this chapter it really is all about. During Paul's day, it was meat that was used specifically for idol worship. Uh, what, are, you know, what, are some, what are some kind of uh, situations you might confront today? Um, it, it might be whether or not a Christian should have a television, whether or not a Christian uh, should go to the theater, whether or not uh, you ought to have, oh, and we violated this big time and, at the funeral last week, um, whether or not you ought to have a guitar in the service. Um, you know, th- those things have to, have, to be, uh, have to be looked at. And, you know, there's, there's not... There's not direct commands in Scripture, but there's always principles. And that's why I say it's it's so vital that you get in your Bible, you find out where God is in general in areas, and then you can make specific decisions in your own personal life. Um, Some some of those things are liberty issues. Uh, What are some, some issues that are not... Liberty issues. Let me give you a, a let me give you a, a starting place, and then you can you can fill in some blanks for me. Okay, booze is not a liberty issue. 
The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. What does that mean? Stay away from the booze. Look not upon the wine when it turneth itself awry. In the... That's not a liberty. Well, I have liberty in Christ, so I can drink wine. Uh, no, <laughs> you can, but when you do, you will violate a direct command of God. If I've never seen, I've never seen a Christian who said, I, can, I, I have liberty, so I can do that. I've never seen them grab the wine like this with their eyes closed so they don't look on it and then put it to their lips and then drink it. Never seen that. Uh, they're violating it if they're looking at it, okay? Uh, it says, look not upon the wine. Just stay away from this stuff. So there's, there's one example. Give me some more. What are some, what are some things that are not liberty issues? They're pretty clear cut. Or at least there's guidelines to go by. Yes, ma'am. Gossiping and slander. Okay, gossiping and slander. Uh, any kind of a railing, uh, strife, accusation. And of course, that's one of the problems that they had in Corinth. They had contentions and they had strifes and divisions and were proud and so forth. And that's, you say, well, I have a right to do that. No, no you don't. <laughs> You're in violation of the word of God. Okay, what else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, salvation. Uh, by repenting and believing on Christ. Uh, only, only through him. Uh, that's, that, that one's pretty cut and dry. What else? There was an issue already talked about here in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this book. Dave? Well, I was just thinking stealing. Stealing, there you go. Is it, is it ever right to steal? No, it's not. It's not. It's, it's not a, you say, yeah, but I, I, have, I, have, I have Christian liberty. <laughs> yeah, you do now. You won't when you find yourself in jail because you're convicted. So, uh, you know, yes. Fornication. Yeah, fornication, adultery, okay? That is not a liberty issue. Uh, none of those things are liberty issues. Anything else? Yes, sir. Swearing. Okay, swearing, what, the, the way you use your mouth. Then there are other things. And, you know, uh, for instance, dress is not a liberty issue. And I hear all the time people saying, well, dress is a liberty issue. No, there's guidelines for dress in the Word of God. Find out what they are and go by them. Uh, well, music's a liberty issue because there's so many different styles. No, there's guidelines in the Word of God for music. Find out what they are and then live by it. Um, there's a lot of things that Christians today are saying, well, that's a liberty issue. It's not a liberty issue at all. It's not a liberty issue at all. And if you went back 50, you, I was going to say 100. You don't even have to go back 100. You go back 50 years there's some things that we're saying we have liberty to do, and you can go ahead and fill in the blank, uh, that back 50 years ago they never would have said that because they knew where, where, what that issue entailed, and there's, there's often more to it. But we're, we're going to look at, at just three basic factors tonight, and that's what's on your notes. Three basic factors that you need to consider when, when it comes to uh, these, these areas of Christian liberty, and particularly Christian liberty and the weak. The first one, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to read these passages again just so we get refamiliarized with them and we can hone in on them. It says, Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything. Uh, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us, there is but one God, the Father, 
of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So the first thing is knowledge. And uh, that, that, that's just simply the, the facts of the issue from God's viewpoint. And the facts in this issue are, are thus. Verse 4 says that the idols are nothing. And by the way, according to verse 8, neither is the meat. The meat isn't anything. The idols uh, aren't anything. Uh, verses 4 through 6 says there's only one God. Uh, you know, they may be worshiping so-called other gods, but there aren't other gods. So it's really all for naught, and it's, 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 really, it's really fruitless. Um, in verse 6, it says that our God created all things. The Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. Verse 6 also says he created us. But, but however, knowledge all by itself is not enough. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I found out about, uh, about the, the Greeks and the Romans was that the Greeks and Romans were polytheistic, and that's why they worshipped gods. They believed that, that demons could gain entrance to their bodies by attaching themselves to their food. So they would, they would attach themselves, this is what they thought, they would attach themselves to the food, then they would eat the food, and therefore they become devil-possessed. And, and the sacrifice uh, gained the favor of their God and, and then also cleansed the food. Um, offerings were divided when, when they gave that meat. There was a third of it that was burned on the altar. There was a third of it that was given to the priests as payment. And then there was a third of it that was capped uh, by the offerer. And, and the believers would, uh, would, encount, would, would encounter this meat in a, in a lost, as I said, sometimes they go into a lost Gentile home uh, or at the market or a social function. And they, they, they said, okay, so, so what do we do uh, in, that, in that given situation? How do we, how do we handle uh, how do we handle that thing? Um, and as I as said before, knowledge alone, and this is what verse 1 says, says, verse 1 says, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And those things that I just listed about there being one God and not many gods and God is the creator and uh, the meat is nothing, the offering is nothing, it really doesn't mean anything. However, it says, knowledge puffeth up. In other words, when knowledge is all by itself, it has a tendency to cause you to get prideful. And that was one of the problems that the Corinthians had. Uh, they, in fact, that's one, the reason why there were so many divisions, why there was contention only by pride. We talked about this before. Only by pride cometh contention. And so... Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the situation uh, was that they had lots of knowledge, but they didn't have a whole lot of charity. And, uh, and, and understand this, that, that, again, knowledge by itself is not enough. Um, for instance, you do this with a, with a child. Uh, you go to put a child to bed. You turn out the light. You close the door and you go into the living room, and all of a sudden, about five minutes later, you hear a cry. And you go into the, into the room, and the child says, I'm scared. I'm scared. I can't sleep. I'm scared. There's, what, monsters under the bed or whatever. And those of you that have had kids, you know they, they're afraid of the dark for whatever reason. What do you do? Well, if you're a kind parent, you go get a nightlight, you plug it into the, either the bathroom or, and leave the door cracked or you, you plug it into their room. Is that thing going to protect them? No, of course not. No, it isn't. But it's going to give them peace of mind. Why do you do that? Do you do that because you're stupid? No, you do that because you love your kid. And, and, and again, uh, you say, yeah, but 
they had some wrong ideas about this, this meat and the sacrifices and the gods and all that stuff. Uh, you know, so it really didn't mean anything. So you just go ahead and eat that meat. Well, hang on. Hang on. Do you love the people you're dealing with? And that's, that's really the bottom line. That takes us to the next point, which you find, you find this particularly in verses 1 through 3. It says, now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Edifieth means strengthens. Uh, it lifts you up, it helps you, it encourages you. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. And now uh, the other thing he's doing there too is he's, he's equating the, the fact of if, if you're lacking charity toward others, you're probably also lacking love toward God because those two are connected. The first commandment is love the Lord thy God with all your heart. And the second is like unto it, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. And so the, the issue there is, is, is caring for others and loving others. And by the way, charity in Scripture, and I challenge you to, to study this, charity in Scripture is never toward God, nor does it say that God has charity toward us. Charity is always one person to another, and it's only Christians that can do it. Lost people can't. You know, they, they say they have their charities. Well, they may have their charities, but they don't have any charity if they're not saved. Because that's only possible as the love of God flows through us and touches the lives of, of other people. And, uh, and that's, that's true charity. Uh, charity is, is, is the balance for knowledge. Keep your finger here and go to, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, look down in verse 15. Ephesians 4, 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Uh, speaking the truth in love causes others to grow, causes the speaker who's speaking the truth in love to grow. But both of those things have to be there together. you got to speak it, but you got to speak it in love. And by the way, people know when you love them, when you give them truth, and when you really don't care and you're giving them truth. They can tell the difference. Um, Another one, look with me over Philippians 1. Next book, Philippians 1. Look down at verse 9. It says, and this I pray, and this is one of the things that Paul prayed for the Philippian Christians. He said, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He said, listen, it's, it's good to, to, to love folks, but you need to love them with knowledge and you need to love them uh, with judgment. Uh, knowledge is a controlling factor of the love so that it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, knowledge alone causes pride. You add charity and immediately you get edification. And it's not only edification of the person that you're loving, but you find that you grow as well and get strengthened because you've, you've, added, you've added charity uh, to, to the knowledge that God has given to you. Uh, love is the outlet for the knowledge. And uh, knowledge and love to, uh, uh, help, help each other, temper each other, and, uh, and put, put a check on one another. The, the love helps the knowledge go out properly, and the knowledge helps the love go out properly. Both of those work together. Then the, then the third thing is the conscience. And this is the conscience of the person who, uh, who is upset or offended uh, because you're eating the meat. Um, look in, in verses 7 through 13. It says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. In other words, not, not everybody's at the same same uh, uh, level of Christian knowledge and growth. 
For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And again, and I said this last week, and I'll reiterate it tonight, Anytime you find yourself focusing on your liberty, it's out of whack. The, 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 uh, the thing that is the most important is not the liberty you have, but whether or not Christ is glorified, whether or not Christ is honored. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy, thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend." Um, eating, eating that meat, one of the things that it did was it, it pulled, it pulled uh, some, of, uh, some of the folks back into old habits that they, they had turned away from after they had gotten saved and brought them back into that idol-worshiping culture and, and was, was detrimental to them. The conscience is can be straightened out uh, by proper knowledge. For instance, um, early in, in, uh, in my ministry, when I was out in Green Bay, we came across some verses because, and some of it was due to books that we had been reading. And, some, and sometimes you have to be careful because sometimes the books will uh, will steer you in a particular direction that maybe isn't necessarily the direction of the scripture that you're reading, and it starts to starts to to mold and make your opinion on the thing. But we uh, look at it with me. Uh, go with me over to Jeremiah 10. There was a time when my wife and I d had a discussion about should we have Christmas trees in our house. And uh, I read a book that had to do with the Babylonian religion, had, and it related it to Roman Catholicism. It was a good book in many, many ways. One of the things it said is, is that Christmas trees are part of Baal worship, and uh, therefore uh, you should not have a Christmas tree in your house. And, and what they used as a proof text was Jeremiah chapter 10. Look with me in verse 1. Hear the words which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed by the signs of heaven, for the, the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. There you go, he's cutting the tree. The work of the hands of the, of the workmen with the ax, they deck it. With silver and gold, deck the halls with boughs of hell. There you go, right there. That's a Christmas tree. They fasten it with nails. Well, it's the stand uh, with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Man, it's obvious. That's a Christmas tree. And then I read the next part of the that verse 5, be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is, in it, is it in them to do good. Them? Them what? You know, I believe those were. They may not have been exactly like what you see today, but they were, a, I believe, a type of totem pole. What they would do is they, they would take a, a tree they would cut it down. They'd fasten it down below. They, they, when, when it said they deck it with, with silver and gold, it was gold plates that were put around it. They had faces on them. 
and they, 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 they worshiped them. That, that, that was their obelisk. That was their, that was their God. Uh, and, uh, and people, people were afraid because they thought those things had powers. When have you ever seen that with a Christmas tree? Well, you know, again, we went through stages on that thing. By the way, you see a young Christian going through and struggling through stages. Don't stand there and criticize them. You've gone through those things yourself. There are things that I contemplated believing and taking a stand against, you know, uh, back years ago that I realized, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's not what the Bible's talking about, and that's one of those cases, okay? Uh, <laughs> we, we, had a, we had a guy leave the church in Green Bay and start his own church, and one of the main issues he left over was that Pastor Keck and Brother Dunbar have Christmas trees. What a stupid thing to lo- leave a church over. But again, uh, knowledge will affect your love, and love will affect your knowledge. And, uh, and you've, you've, you've got to have, you got to have both, and it's got to be, it's got to be proper. Um, well, let's see. Uh, the conscience of a weak Christian. Uh, three things can happen, and it's, it's described here in this passage. Uh, the conscience of a weak Christian in verse 7 can be defiled. The conscience of a weak Christian in, in verse 12 can be wounded. And the conscience of a weak Christian can be offended, according to verse 13. Um, all those things are possible. And by the way, when I say a weak Christian, it's not always a young Christian. It can be an older Christian. You know, I, I, again, there was, there was a, a lady in, uh, in the church in Green Bay, and... Uh, she absolutely hated uh, men wearing Christian men wearing beards. She said that's that's ungodly, that's worldly, that's wrong. They shouldn't. Well, did you ever go to the scripture and find out that they they pulled Jesus's beard out? They plucked out his beard. Well, he had one. You say, well, just explain that to her and wear the beard anyway. You know what? Uh, Both preacher and I decided that if that was going to cause her to stumble, it wasn't worth it to have a beard or a mustache or any of that stuff. Are you listening, Aaron? Huh? Are you listening? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm teasing you. But I don't think there's anybody in this church that that has a problem with it. But here's, here's the question. Here's, here's, here's the question. If there's something that you really, really hold dear and like, would you be willing to give it up because it bothered somebody and it caused them to stumble? That's the issue. The issue is, do you love folks enough to be willing to do that? And I've, my wife and I have talked about that with about various topics and subjects and things and said, you know what, if this ever becomes an issue, we'll get rid of this. If this ever becomes an issue, we'll stop that. You know, uh, we've, we've, had, we've had people, we've had speakers that, um, number one, they, they don't, they don't want to go to any restaurant on, uh, on a Sunday. Uh, okay. Okay. They say because because Sunday is the Sabbath. Well, Sunday isn't the Sabbath. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we we worship on Sunday, but it's not the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given to Jews. It wasn't given to the church. So so, you know, that's it's a little off. Uh, there there's Christians that I have have been with that say uh, I would never go into a, a restaurant and eat food where they where they have booze of any kind okay well i i will uh i i I don't like the ones that are primarily bars uh i i don't like the ones where it's all together i like it separate um but you're gonna be you're gonna pretty much stick with uh wendy's uh, arby's uh uh mcdonald's and burger king if uh, if if that's where you're at around here 
Uh, but that's fine. You say, so, so what do you do when those people say that? We don't take them there. And we, we stay clear of it. Why? Because we love the people. We love the people. Uh, now, now, uh, you go over to Romans 14, and it talks about the same type of subject. And, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that I have said often and will continue to say, uh, you know, I don't ever want to cause somebody to stumble, but I'm not going to kowtow to anybody who's a contentious person. If they're contentious, there's something else going on. And, and honestly, what that is, is that's, that's that business up in the beginning of chapter 8 where it talks about love. The love has to be there. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Yeah. When I, when I first got saved, you know, according to an older preacher, so this concept for me mm -hmm. was like super uh, imbalanced, if that's a word. That's the best way to say it. Super what? Mm -hmm. And then he held his big foot out behind the pulpit and he had a cowboy boot on. Yeah, a cowboy boot on. And it was really helpful to see, you know, because as a new Christian, there were so many things I was like throwing out of my life. And that the Lord is patient. I was so afraid to be, like, like I, I God wants to answer my question. No, you don't, no, you do not have to ask me this whole day about prayer. No. I mean, I, even if I want, but you don't have to. And I feel like that can be a time bending where it's like, like really, you know what? Mm -hmm. the, the whole thing has to, has to be tempered. And the, the, the charity tempers the knowledge. The knowledge directs the, the charity. Um, the other thing, uh, there's, a, there's a checklist. And I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to go over this quickly, and then, then pretty much I'm done here tonight. But there's a checklist that you can follow. And let me encourage you to write these down. Hebrews 12, 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and so forth. These are some things that you can ask yourself when one of these questionable things come across your path. And you can say, well, how does, how does it fit this? And how does it fit this? This is a checklist. First one is Hebrews 12 and verse 1. We're going to go quickly through these. So get your fingers limber. Hebrews 12, verse 1. It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so, which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Um, you can ask yourself, is it a weight? Now, a weight is not a sin. But it could be slowing you down. It could be excess baggage. So if one question you can ask yourself is, is it a weight? Is it a weight? And obviously, is it sin? <laughs> okay, if it's sin, well, you already got your answer. You stop right there. You don't have to go down through the rest of the checklist. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Second question. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, we've already gone over this previous weeks. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Second question is, is it expedient?
Is it expedient? Is it expedient for others? Is it expedient for you? It, it, you know, it may be something that you can do, but may not be the wisest use of your time. First John 2. And verse 6. <coughs> First John chapter 2 and verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Of course, that's talking about Jesus Christ. Is this, is this something Christ would do? Is it something Christ would do? Would Christ be pleased if I did it? 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy 4 verse 12. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And does it set the right example? Does it set the right example? You know, there's a, there's a term that's running around today, and that's the term influencers. They talk about different people, different websites, different uh, social media that, is, that are influencers. Can I tell you something? As a Christian, you're an influencer. Now, you're a good influencer if you do it right, but people are watching you. People are watching you. Um, you know, there's, there's reasons why I do some of the things that I do. For instance, one of the things that you'll see every Sunday morning, you'll see me put uh, an offering, unless I forgot it, which there are, sometimes I have, but I'll put an offering. Uh, I have to grab one of the ushers because sometimes they forget that I've got one, and I put it in the, in the offering plate. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, hey, look at me, I'm giving. I want, I want our folks to know that the preacher participates in the offering. There's some preachers that don't. I don't think that's a good example. Um, you know, I know we have online giving. That's fine, and I'm not criticizing anybody for using it. I'm not. But, but the Lord pressed upon my heart, the kids in this church need to see that their preacher gives. And it's not one of those, you know, one of these deals. That's not what I'm saying. They just need to know that, you know, that, that uh, at least in that area, the preacher's being obedient. I think it's a testimony. Uh, Colossians 4, 5. By the way, you're, you're, an, you're an example whether you know it or not. You're either a good one or a bad one. Colossians 4, 5. It says, uh, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And this has to do with, is this going to be a, a good testimony? To the lost. Good testimony to the lost people. Will it be a good testimony to lost people? And boy, trust me, your lost relatives, the lost people that you work with, they're watching you. They are watching you. They're observing what you do. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. 1 Corinthians 10, 23. 
1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, all, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Does it edify? Does it edify me? Does it edify others? Does it edify anybody? Are there any benefits? And last of all, same chapter, down in verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. For if by grace, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Uh, does, and then down in verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Does it glorify God? Does it glorify God? All right. I'm done. Any any questions, comments, observations, illustrations? Yes, David. Uh huh. Yeah. So if you're, if you're trying, if you think you're doing this and you're confessing God, well, that doesn't mean uh, your word stays right there, and everybody, and everybody eventually should be in hell. And even I think especially in, in the general of young Christians who come down that road, helping them to maybe not not, not criticize them. Mm -hmm. Honestly, well, using that as an example because you brought it up. So. Yeah. Because I've, I've seen other things. Sure, sure. Well, and here's the other thing. There's, there's been, in recent years, there's been such a war on Christmas that people might think it's strange if a Christian doesn't ha do whatever, you know. Uh, you know, it doesn't give gifts. It doesn't uh, uh, celebrate Christmas in one, one way or another. Listen, we all know Jesus was not born on December 25th. No kidding. But the rest of the world doesn't have a clue. Um, there is not a better time. The penners will tell you this. And, and, uh, and I've, I've seen it. They've seen it. There's no better time to give out tracts in Christmas time. No better time. You wish them a Merry Christmas, give them a tract, they'll take it. 99.9% .9 of the time. And they'll look at it, and if it's a chick track, they'll read it because they, they can't read. They can only look at pictures. And, uh, you know, a lot of truth to that. All right, any other thoughts, questions, comments, observations, examples, illustrations? Yes, ma'am. Jennifer. Uh huh. One of the little supporting pastors taught the children to do it, but it's nerve wracking to have no beard. Mm -hmm. My dad said, Well, I'll shave it off then. And I took a note and just wrote back. And my dad said, As long as you support me, I'll never grow a head of beard. He hasn't had a beard since. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a situation where uh, he decided that uh, loving that preacher was, was uh, more important than having hair on his face. Uh, honestly, God will put you in that position somewhere, somewhere in life, and it'll, it'll happen maybe many times. Uh, again, my wife and I have talked about certain things. I said, look, if, we ever, if, if anybody stumbles over this, this is gone. If, if anybody ever stumbles over this that we do, we'll stop doing it. And, and, and I would. I'd do it in a heartbeat. 
stop it, stop it quickly. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line is, do you care for people more than you care for the things that you care for? <laughs> you know, are things more important to you or is people more important to you? People ought to be. Anybody else? Yeah, Debbie. Mm-hmm. Then you know what? If it makes me feel better, you know, but our heart has to be right as well, and not well. We're this or that person, or this or some. It has to be the good thing about that person. And we don't want to have a call. Um, but like you said, if we're one of those pretentious people, then and that, I think that's why the working part has to come is to understand where that is. I'll never forget uh, Sam Gipps said he was door knocking one time and uh, came across somebody who claimed to be saved and said that they, uh, they but they stopped going to church. He said, well, why'd you stop going to church? Well, because they were going to put, bring a piano and an organ in and they're going to put the piano on the wrong side and uh, on one side and the, the, the organ on the other and they had the sides wrong. <laughs> said, well, well, which side should it have gone on? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> Brother Gibbs said, that person didn't have a piano problem, an organ problem. They had a contentious problem. Uh, they had an attitude problem. And uh, he's absolutely right. And by the way, this, this chapter was not about meat. Okay, if, if you walk away and say, well, we learned about offering meat to idol or uh, meat to idols tonight. No, no, we didn't. We learned about knowledge and charity and the fact that uh, what you do ought to edify others. And if it doesn't, even if it's something that you have the liberty to do. And again, uh, we're living in the day and age when, the, the, you know, the Laodicea, I believe we're in the Laodicean church age. The, the word Laodicea means people's rights. You hear this from Christians all the time. I have liberty. What they're saying is, I have rights. No, you don't. You don't have any rights. God has all the rights. And we should be doing what he wants us to do. All God's people said, amen and amen. I'm going to ask you to break up into groups tonight and just pray. Um, I know we've gone a little bit, we've gone a lot long. I like to keep it at 30 minutes, and I did not do that tonight. I apologize for that, but I did want to get through the chapter. Let me give you a, a prayer request to add to, to your list. You've got, uh, under salvation, there's two groups of people, uh, some videos that have been a, some a, a added, and then uh, uh, the um, uh, videos also added another one. They've got the two, two lists of people. You can pray for those folks. Uh, also, to pray for Grant. He's going in Friday for shoulder surgery. And pray, pray for him. He's you're looking at that with a little bit of fear and trepidation. I, I understand that. I, I've, I've been there, done that, had two knees replaced and a, and a, uh, a back work done. So uh, be, be in prayer for him. By the way, uh, there is a difference when people pray and they go through surgery and a difference when people don't pray and they go through surgery. So pray. Uh, you say, well, I, you know, I, I don't feel like I can do very much for Grant. Yeah, you can do an awful lot for him. Pray for him. Pray for him. All right, find yourself a partner. Let's break up and, uh, well, let's break up. That sounds like, let's have a fight. Uh, <laughs> let's break, break up into groups, amiable, amiable groups, and uh, let's pray. As soon as you're done praying, you are dismissed.